So thanks very much, Claudio. Um, thanks everybody um, for listening to my talk despite the busy pre-Christmas uh, times and end of semester. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about <coughs> a larger research project we are we are working on, which, yeah, as Claudio said, endeavors into different directions, leading to many new questions and interesting um, thinking processes. So I'm just throwing this all at you and I'm happy to discuss anything you deem interesting afterwards. This is a picture or pictures like this you see every day in the news. We have a, I'm not sure if it's a growing set, but it's already a large set of global challenges that seem to have been occurring out of nowhere all of a sudden altogether. And most of us are quite overwhelmed by them. And we think one of the reasons why this is happening is that humans are really bad at foreseeing the consequences of their actions over longer periods of time. So wouldn't it be interesting if we could compress time? Probably we cannot do it in reality, but maybe we can do something that signals to the people gives them information about the long-term consequences of what they're currently doing today. Society has one um, quite popular means of signaling invented over the, uh, over the centuries. It's called money. We use money to value things, to um, direct our resources and our energy towards certain goals. And it also, of course, signals to us. So, we even have this saying, time is money. So, money is a signal of what is valuable to us, individually and as a collective. We are not always sure what is valuable to us as a collective, but money is definitely one of the most used ways of, of, of signaling this. A slightly different perspective is if we look at money as a future potential, something like stored energy. And it's not only that, it's also directed energy. We can steer it in a direction and something will happen. We can mobilize resources, we can mobilize people. This is what money is all about, right? The possibility to do something or get something done. Today, unfortunately, um, it's a unidirection um, because all of us, whatever you do during your days, I mean, all of us here are most probably at the in academia, but um, also in, in, in the outside world, no matter whether people work in an NGO or um, in a corporation, at the end of the day, flows of money direct our activities. All of us are at the end maximizing income or profit and trying to minimize cost, no matter what the mission of the organization. And finally, an interesting aspect, which, is, which I think is way under-discussed, is that money creation is the privilege of very few people and very few organizations, usually banks. And the question is just why? One possible answer. They who control the credit of a nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. It's a very powerful instrument to be in charge or be able to control money flows. So, therefore, the next slide with three simple statements or goals, let's say, could either be just that, simple statements, and yeah, looks interesting as an academic project, or it could be revolutionary, depending on your stance on the matter of the monetary system today. So we, will, we would like to try to extend this concept of money as an information signal. That this information it could carry, it actually does carry and we act upon it. We want to explore new monies, in plural, to represent different directions, different incentive systems. Because all of us are different people. We value different things differently. And today's money system is not capturing this. And thirdly, uh, we want to experiment by letting everyone design new monies, which is quite different to what we have today. 
And now I'd like to show you a video, a two minutes video of how, how that is supposed to happen. Let's see if it works right away. I guess I will not be able to. Oh, yeah. These often seem to be detached from your daily choices. For example, biking to work is a choice that benefits a few communities. Your boss might be happy because you're healthier, and the company has lower costs for providing parking space. Your city has fewer problems with commuter traffic and improved air quality. And because you don't need to fill up your tank, you are helping to reduce the global consumption of fossil fuels. Or let's say you only buy clothing from socially sustainable sources, where employers pay their staffs a living wage and foster a healthy work environment. In reality, many people choose to drive to work, and many prefer to buy cheap clothes from employers who exploit their workforces. Local and global values do not easily translate into individual incentives. But every day, many people and communities do actually make vital contributions towards achieving common human goals in the realms of environmental sustainability, health and care work, social integration, education and beyond. It's just that our current economic system is so bad at valuing these social goals and services. Shouldn't it be easier to value these kinds of contributions? Imagine a new system, which we call Finance 4.0 in which interest groups and communities could define positive actions and reward people who carry them out. These rewards would take the form of a variety of digital currencies which would represent different shared values. Imagine if you could collect ecology coins and health coins for your morning bike rides and sustainability coins for buying fair clothes. You could then use your coins to access rewards that the communities choose such as a free bike service or discounts. In this way, we can build a decentralized system of incentives that empowers everyone to make everyday choices that benefit our world. Find out more in our other videos and visit us at www.futureict2.eu So imagine if you could create currency or let's be more modest, tokens that stand for something that could be used as money or monetary, something similar to money. What would you create? <clears throat> what action is not enough of, well, what action is not done enough today because it's not rewarded? What would you like to see more of? And this picture is just one frame of thinking about this, of course. What, what tokens would you create if you could to solve one or more of the problems we actually have. Because obviously today's money is not really solving them through the mechanisms we have today. So when designing this finance 4.0 system, how we currently call it, um, we had a few design principles in mind. I want to show you the four most important ones. I just touched upon the first one multi-dimensional incentive system. We want to be able, and, and that's the symbol of this, this picture, that people are dragged in different directions because they have different motivations. But today you cannot manifest and show them because you have only this one-dimensional money system we have. If you have different tokens for different activities to pursue different goals, people will be able to claim them and obtain them and use them. That goes together with a second principle, which is also very different to today. We want to allow basically anyone to make proposals for designs of currencies, of monies, of tokens, bottom up, without permission. And <clears throat> you can guess it, um, one of the reasons why we are able to do this is because we are using a technology um, that allows to build decentralized networks of peers and allows these peers to transfer value across these networks in a secure way. And one step further in the thinking, of course, leads sooner or later to the question, how would such a system be governed? How would it run? Who, who would make decisions and how? And of course, the starting point for us, because there are other projects, 
We also try to build networks to incentivize certain behavior. They do not necessarily have democratic governance as a design principle. So what, what's important to understand now is we are not just developing a piece of software. We do that, and it's important that it runs and, and has as, uh, as few bugs as possible. And I'm happy that we have Ben, who is taking care of this and making sure that's actually true. But the proper challenge is that we, in all modesty, try to enable new economies through that software by applying crypto economic design principles as much as they are already existing, it's a very new field, and distributed ledger technology. But what we're really trying to do is to think about the foundations, the basic mechanisms necessary to let complex systems of interaction emerge. And for <coughs> those in the audience who still think, how is that possible to be done with Bitcoin? It's not just about Bitcoin. If nothing else, Bitcoin has made money into a general design problem, as it should be. And not just the design of financial products or the look of paper bills, but of vast abstractions of time, debt, work, and prestige. So we try to rethink money as a design problem. That can be quite overwhelming. So we work together with my colleagues, Mark and Evangelos, on a paper like Claudio and colleagues also has done. It's a, a, a good exercise in many, in many ways to try to come up with a taxonomy of all these DLT blockchain systems that are out there. Because it's, it's a very heterogeneous landscape and people try out many, many different things and go in many different directions. So if you're interested, have a look at this <coughs> paper. It's on archive. We have just uploaded the, the second version with considerable um, extensions. What I want to show you here is this is the conceptual model of how we structure our techno uh, technology, <laughs> structure our taxonomy to analyze these different uh, systems. And if you read the paper, you will see you have different possibilities in each of these attributes. They can be yes or no, they can, um, um, well, they have just different values for different attributes. And just for a theoretical exercise, I counted all the different possibilities. So for this branch, you have 72 different possibilities. For the consensus branch, you have 64. For the action branch, eight. And for the token branch, you have a whopping 480. Putting this all together, this taxonomy theoretically allows for 17 million, 18, nearly 18 million different designs. Now, most probably the majority of them just don't make sense. The problem is we don't know which do not make sense and which ones would make sense but are very far from what we have today and are hard to figure out just by sitting there and thinking about it. So that can be a very complex thing to do and very theoretical as well. Let's start much more easy. You plant a tree and you prove it to the system that you planted the tree and the system gives you a tree token. It doesn't give you 10 francs or 10 euros or 5 euros or 15 euros. I don't know what Christmas trees currently go for in Zurich. Um, and it's anyway a big discussion about the Christmas trees, isn't it? But you get a tree token. And the tree token symbolizes what the person who created the tree token wanted it to symbolize. Maybe it's CO2 capture capacity. Maybe it's the shade in summer. Maybe it's the wood to create warmth. It could be a lot of different things. And we don't know. And of course, we are doing many different things. Or we should do many different things. And of course, that system would be supporting all kinds of different tokens that represent certain activities, certain actions. More in, in a more schematic way, you as a user, and the system is really open to anyone to use it, you do something in the real world. You plant a tree, you use the bike instead of the car, you help a person in need, whatever it is. 
Then you go to the system, you see what the, to the, the whole universe of tokens that have been created by different communities that reward what they value, and you choose. If you're interested in the tree token, you go for the tree token. If you're interested in something else, you do something else. You claim it by saying, hey, I did plant a tree, please give me a tree token. Then you have to prove it. The proving um, arrow here is supporting you in, with different mechanisms for proving. Maybe it's the location you are, maybe it's the upload of a photo, maybe it's, it's sensors of an IoT network, maybe it's other people, other users, who would also need to be incentivized to, to check your, your claim and make a proof. We, this we call social proof and then we are not yet there with how that could work. But um, so in, in short, you have different possibilities of how to go about proving. Currently, tech, uh, technology-wise, I think we have approximately half a dozen of different proof mechanisms. We can talk about them later if you're interested. So in any case, let's assume that works out and the system says, okay, you actually planted a tree, then you obtain tokens. As simple as that, isn't it? Now, if you think for a moment <coughs> of a platform on the web without registration, without logins, where you just can go and do things, people come and do things. Some things you like, many things you don't like, many more things that are may maybe irrelevant, but we can safely assume at one point there will be a lot of different tokens, and not all of them will make sense. Some be, may actually be detrimental, but because it's a blockchain, we are not able to delete tokens. There is no administrator with root privileges, to use some jargon, who can kick out people, delete tokens he or she doesn't like, etc. It's all not possible. And we try to look at it in a positive way because what we want is massive innovation in the space. We want to have anyone with a good idea to be able to make this proposal. Now then the question is, how do you, how do you come up with the good tokens? So while the base layer is about all these what we call positive action tokens for all kinds of things, all of you would have different proposals, I guess, tonight, we have a second layer which is about the economy at large of the whole system and the governance of these multi-token economies. So we would have a governance token that helps us to promote the good tokens inside through a democratic process that is a mix between poker and voting. I will get to that a few slides from now. We will also have a reputation token that people in the system can, can gain over time not by creating wealth on the system, so it's not about that you have 1,000 tree tokens and Claudia only has 10, and therefore you have a much higher reputation. We are hesitant to link these two things because wealth and reputation in our understanding should not be linked. And there are activities on the platform you can do that are not related to receiving tokens. So for example, proving the actions of others is not something you would get tokens for directly but you could get reputation for. And the least developed concept um, is thinking about... Bring, so, so we want to embrace the network effects that occur when, when several communities from different directions start to use the platform and have their tokens there. And one way of thinking about this is whenever a token gets promoted to be a good official token through a process I will explain, this token base could be backed up by something like a reserve currency. Um, there are different ideas how that could look and there are a lot of questions how it should be done. Um, but that would be the idea of this. So, so we would incentivize communities by providing a mechanism to, to, to liquefy and, and, and be able to, to create markets. Because at the end what we want is to have markets on these tokens. And, yeah, identity, but I'm not going into that today. So you can see there are a ton of questions, and it's, it's a quite
quite unfamiliar terrain because this discipline literally does not exist yet. This combination of hardcore cryptography and, 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 um, yeah, and, 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 and functions to secure certain processes that are quite on vogue now because of Bitcoin in the last 10 years. Um, and so, on the, so we don't even have a clear and commonly agreed definition of the space, or even a word. Some people talk about cryptoeconomics or cryptoeconomic design, other people talk about token engineering, depending on where they come from and what they stress in the space. So on the left side, I just provided you a few definitions I like. Ours is also there, but the one in blue is from Michael Sagan from Block Science. Create interconnected communities of autonomous actors within which efficient value exchange is enabled by technology. I think that's a nice and short way of capturing the essence of, it, what, of what we are trying to do. So what allows us, uh, what, what, what would this crypto-economic design allow us to do? And this is what you can see on the right side. It enables new socio-economic models because we can create any type of money we think should be tried out. Maybe we, we cannot call all of this money because it doesn't fit the current definition of money. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's reputation or it's rights like voting rights or access rights. Or it's a whole different thing. We can do in vitro experiments with concepts and, and ideas that are not very new but um, which we couldn't try out so far because we, we lack the technological means to do so at, at large scale. So in governance, it's certain, uh, a few different um, concepts, like whole accuracy of Yutuki. In economics, you can do prediction markets or curation markets. I'm sure you have heard about decentralized autonomous organizations. Aragon is a project that has not much to do with academia, as far as I know, but they're moving ahead quite strongly in providing a completely on-chain governance system for all kinds of organizations. And there's even very exotic stuff like artificial life forms. Plant to eat or also Terra Zero are examples where some call it life, depending on your definition of what life is, a thing that has a Bitcoin wallet and is able to pay you for services you give it to the thing autonomously is kind of alive. And this plant to eat is a, is a project by Primavera de Filippi, um, an art project. But it's so, so the plants, uh, the plant to eats are basically paying users for creating new plant to eats. So the, the important, I think, the crucial question in all of this is the power distribution that you build in by design, because you have to start somewhere, you have to give the thing rules. Um, and that raises questions. So, <clears throat> who decides about the crypto-economic design of such a platform in the first place? And who decides who is able to decide about it? Are participants on the platform there as volunteers, or has some higher power asked them to be there? That has a corollary, corollary question. Um, can you put sanctions or can you not put, put sanctions? Because if it's an opt-in system, you can go away with sanctions, right? People will not participate if they start with a CO2 account of minus 150, like in a bad game, and they can never reach zero. They will not participate. So after some time, we realize that we are not addressing negative externalities because an opt-in system will not allow us to sanction people. And also, crucially, what are the processes of changing this design? Now, if we come up with a lot of different mechanisms and rules and how the tokens can, can work, and two years from now we realize we have to change some parameters or even basic functionality, how do we do that? If already a few hundred or a few thousand people are on the platform. On-chain governance is the challenge here, and, and um, it is really a challenge because it's just still much easier and we are much more used to have people discuss on forums, vote in some way and then decide on code changes, code gets changed and everybody follows. And a few other things um, more related to, to ethics. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just 
raising it here, but not going to details anymore. If you look at it more systematically, like Michael Sargum did, um, then you can structure such a system in five layers. On the left side, in grey colour, you see the generic proposal by, by Michael. Um, and, and we can already summarize it a bit. So the bottom two layers together are what we would call the blockchain. This DLT, this distributed ledger technology, offers us two things. Dur durable data, meaning trustworthy information about the state of the network and who has how many tokens. And also trusted computation. Smart contracts that once deployed and, and active, make sure if certain conditions are met, certain tokens are transferred or created. And nobody can interfere anymore, like the central banks today interfere with the money creation process at large scale. This is what he calls enabling economy, because it's already an economy in itself. Bitcoin is an economy in itself. Ethereum, which is the largest smart contract platform today in operation um, is also an economy. There is cryptocurrency moving in the system to make sure the whole network processes smart contracts that we deploy on the network. So in this enabling economy enables an economy above it. First of all, by creating and enabling interaction patterns. Because if you don't put some rules or, or mechanisms, people could do anything and it wouldn't make sense, right? Um, if they could just do anything, there would be no, no direction and purpose of the whole thing. So, but based on these interaction patterns, we hope that over time, the desired behavior of these agents emerges. That people actually go and plant trees to get tree tokens. They collect plastic at the oceans. They do whatever they think is important and needed in the sense of the mission of the whole platform. Because at the end, what we would like to have is, that, uh, is the, the emergence of value flows according to what these communities really value. So on the right side, I put a, a few words <coughs> that are more mapped to the Finance 4 system, but I'm not going through the details. Basically, here we want to have the three statements, goal statements I showed you in the beginning. Um, and on these two levels, we have governance and, and the daily actions of people doing something and receiving a token. Simplified. It's still getting more complicated, isn't it? But the thing to do when you don't know is not to bluff and not to freeze, but to learn. The way to learn is by experiment, or as Buckminster Fuller put it, by trial and error, error, error. And that's what we try. We haven't been very fast yet, but we try to pick up speed next year. Um, and I would like to show you in the last few slides um, how that is planned to happen. So we have three streams of activities, basically. We have the software demonstrator, a decentralized app, it's a pure coincidence that my surname is the same. Simulations, because you cannot just sit there and think, oh yeah, let's allow them to do this and that, and this nice economy will, will emerge. We, you don't know. And the third one is to try it in real life. Small scale first, and hopefully larger over time. And let me show you one or two slides for each of these. So this is actually a, a screenshot or a collection of screenshots from the current system. This is what you can do today. And if you like to do it, and if you're prepared for the web 3.0, uh, you can go to demo.fin4.net. You need to have MetaMask installed. Um, if not, we can talk about it later, what, what it takes. It's not so difficult. But you need a digital wallet, and MetaMask is just that, a digital wallet that allows you to store tokens and um, to connect to the network. And here you can then create tokens. You can give it different properties, which is 
uh, takes an evening alone to discuss what the properties are and why. You say what actions people should do. Um, you say how new tokens are actually created. And you say something about um, how people should prove the actions they did. Earlier I told you that because all of us could create tokens, you will have a lot of them and you cannot delete them. So it's a bit, uh, I tried to think of an analogy and it would be the stock exchange where you do not have segments but you have all the stocks just there sorted from A to Z and you have no idea if this unknown stock is better or worse uh, than ABB which is the next in line. So what stock exchanges have been doing, they created segments and the segments separate by let's say the strength or the density of the rules and regulations the companies who want to be in that segment have to um, adhere to. So in Germany you have DAX, you have um, SMI in Switzerland, you have the Dow Jones, etc. etc. And there are other segments of course. And you can think of something like this where we try to have a second layer just erected by voting of the people. And this is how it's working. You have a list of, it, it's a different example, excuse me, it's a different example, it's not about the tokens, but imagine the tokens would be listed here, all the official tokens. And it works like this, Claudio can say, hey, I have this great tree token, he doesn't even have to have it created by himself. He can just take one in the pool and, and make an assessment and, and, and an estimate whether it's a good design or not. And he puts it on the table and says, this is a great token, he, it should be promoted to be an official one. He will upload a proposal of a few pages and then people have time to read through an object if they want. An object, oh, and, and um, Claudio will have not only to upload the proposal, but he has to stake tokens, like poker. You put money on the table and say, I bet this makes it to the list. If it doesn't, my money is gone. And the money is this governance token, this GOV token I was mentioning earlier. And I have not a slide about how you get governance token, but um, the idea is that you build reputation over time, and if you reach certain thresholds, you basically unlock new levels of participating in the governance. So the easiest step would be that the lowest level would be that you can participate in such a registry and the next higher level threshold would be that you can make proposals or challenges. So let's continue with the proposal. Claudio staked 300 governance tokens. In that case, the number is arbitrary. And then let's say one week um, of, of voting or decision making starts. And if nobody objects, and challenges the proposal, by default it can be in or out, we decided to have it out. But it's already a design decision if the default is in or out. Let's assume, because it's a more interesting case, that it's challenged and somebody else also puts 300 and says it's not good enough. Then it comes to a vote and everybody in the system who is owner of at least one governance token can participate in the voting. It's a staged system because we do not want that a club of 100 people joins today, proposes a token today and votes it through the thing. And that would be possible if you don't have, a, if you don't have to build reputation over time, which is linked to governance later on. In any case, there's a vote and the winners win and the losers lose their stake. And the losing party gives all their tokens to the winning party. So the proposer slash challenger gets a third of it and two thirds are distributed among the voters. So there are incentives to participate in the voting, there are incentives to challenge and to propose. This thing is called TCR and is one of the crypto economic primitives, you can call it, that have been developed over the last I have to say 18 months to 24 months, it's not even years. And of course you can tweak a lot of these parameters and think about what's better, what's not, and, and there are different token uh, curated registries in the wild. 
Um, we have one particular implementation, but yeah. That's about the software. The simulation, we also thought how to approach this. <coughs> and we soon came to the understanding a, a stage approach makes sense as well. So you start with a very simple system that says people can join anonymously and they can basically just uh, yeah, create, create tokens. And one of the basic solutions we have is by using a blockchain. I mean, you can, could do the whole thing without the blockchain, but it would be a very different system. And you would need administrators that have more rights to, to actually organize the thing. So then you can say, okay, um, flooding of the system by new tokens is a problem, sorry, is a problem, or users cheating is a problem. Um, so we invent proof mechanisms. We say you have to prove that you planted the tree. And of course, it's a whole question in its own. How do you get real data, correct data, into the blockchain system? Um, spamming, I already um, mentioned, or I just explained the TCR idea um, to get a list of trustworthy official positive action tokens. Sorry for the abbreviations. And then we come to reputation, and of course, oh, I'm sorry, and, and the list is, list, it's, it doesn't end here, it's just, as, as you can see here, it's work in progress. So, and over the last weeks, we started with very simple um, simulations by having one user joining and creating a token, the next user joining and creating a token, and then just randomly see what's happening. That gave us much more understanding about dynamics, but we then realized that it's not enough to treat all the users as, a, as this one group of, not things of course, this one group of dots. So currently, and, and this is very much in progress, I cannot show you much more than this. Um, we're thinking about, so how, how does that happen? How does this space evolve? There is a group of people who wants to create tokens because they want to um, make the world a better place, because they want to gain reputation by creating good tokens. Maybe they are malicious and they just want to spam the system and they are maybe malicious and intelligent and create tokens that at first sight seem to be quite good tokens or okay tokens, but only later on you, you will find the flaw. It's a, there can be anything. The same on the user side who want to obtain tokens. They can be nice people trying to support the mission, being there because they think more trees are better and stuff like this. So they can align more or less with, I'm sorry, they can align more or less with uh, the mission of the platform. And finally, the robustness of the design of the token. So and if you normalize it this way, you get a cube from minus one to one in each direction, and you can think of eight subcubes that um, try to be creative and come up with names that um, characterize this subcube. So one, which is an easy one to explain, is the one in the front upper right corner, which we call ideal, which is basically high on all, on all three accounts, high X, high Y, and high Z. And it says, noble, well-intended creators design robust tokens to be claimed by honest users. This is the ideal state, but it's only one of eight possible generic states. And now the interesting question is how do we go on from here? We will try to think of examples for each of the cube, subcubes, and basically let it just run <coughs> and see what's happening. Um, whether, whether, uh, yeah, whether you have um, clustering in certain areas or not, um, the opinions vary on that matter. But yeah, it's, it's a way we, and, and I'm interested to hear also ideas from your side, um, how we could approach this. Um, yeah. Final, second last slide. Experiments, we are in contact with a few different groups um, for next year to try out a few of, of the ideas and designs in real life with real people, which is a challenge, um, not only conceptually, but in the sense of what tokens to create, but also technology-wise. <coughs> I 
I don't know, maybe a quick show of hands, who of you has experience with using, uh, I'm not asking you whether you have Bitcoin, it, the question is have you, have you experienced using um, 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 cryptocurrencies? Has anyone installed something like this MetaMask? Or, who of you has a digital wallet? Uh, in the sense of not, I'm not talking about Apple Pay and stuff like that, but with cryptocurrencies. Half of the people, okay, good. Um, if you have a person who has no idea about what I was talking about, and you tell them, well, you have to install MetaMask to have this digital wallet, and the wallet, of course, is empty, and then you have to get this guess, which has nothing to do with the platform, but it, you still need it because you're on the theorem. It's really difficult to explain and get them understand. So anyway, um, time banking is um, um, a, the, the concept of instead of exchanging money, we say all of us have different skill profiles and backgrounds and expertise, and one hour is one hour. So I give you one hour from, of my expertise, you give Claudia one hour, and ideally it circulates. And these um, time banks exist already for, for quite some time all over the world. And there's one uh, in Zug and in other cities in Switzerland called KISS. And with them, we want to try a, a multi-token setup. Then with the World Wildlife Fund, we have two project ideas, sketches. Um, one is about reforestation in Africa, where they actually have this whole process of somebody plants a tree, and then you have a cascade of verification steps and organizations involved one after the other saying, yeah, the previous one did the correct job, previous one did it, until it ends with the impact investor who says, I spent 100,000 or a million, how many trees do we have? Poaching, poaching means wilderei, um, is a problem in, in Romania, in the Carpathians, and here we think, because the system so far is very much focusing on the individual incentives and the individual person, um, but what about collective action? Could we incentivize collective action? And also, it's not written here, could we incentivize non-action? How would you go about incentivizing a village that the hunters in the village will not poach for one month? Will not shoot animals for one month? How could that work? Could that work, actually? What a what about the design, the design concept of campaigns, basically? You put a bunch of tokens on the table and say, if no animal is killed over the next month in your area, this is yours. You clarify that the hunters don't shoot, because we don't know, even know them. And it's not us, right? It's not the central entity. And then there are more, and <coughs> we, have, we are currently on two projects, uh, two grants with Climate Kick uh, in the area of, of incentivizing or moving the financial space, the financial institutions to more long-term thinking and acting. And um, yeah, we want to use the same system and approach there. Last slide. Mariana Mazzucato wrote a book a year ago, two years ago approximately, The Value of Everything, and I quote from the book, Today, we can work to ensure that all activities promote the outcomes that we want. If the quality and characteristics of an activity in question help deliver true value, then it should be rewarded for being inside this production boundary. And she gives two um, examples. Um, one is favoring long-term investment over short-term. And the other one is also an interesting idea, the founding of new financial institutions, and she gives sort of an idea what that could be, uh, institutions like mission-oriented state investment banks that can provide the strategic long-term finance crucial to the high-risk investments required for exploration and research underlying value creation. So the whole motto of her book is about value is much more than what we measure with money today. And I think we have an additional proposal to make by saying, well, if we have a decentralized, participatory, multidimensional, democratically governed incentive system, realized 
realized on the principles I showed you and implemented with the technologies I showed you, we can also provide such a financial institution. It's just a different one to what Mariana Mazzucato had in mind, namely a peer-to-peer -peer network of equals that can perform the same function, ideally, to give strategic and long-term finance and to de-risk the investment because it would be spread out and to enable um, distributed and parallel exploration and research of value creation. Thanks very much. <laughs>